Well, last week we looked at the theme of how to find hope at Christmas. And today I want us to look at how to find peace at Christmas and literally lifting a phrase from a verse we're going to read in a moment, talk about the way of peace. And we've been looking at it uh, from Luke's gospel and looked at Zacharias and his story and how it contributes to the Christmas story. And today we're going to look at the shepherds. But Zacharias says this in Luke 1 verse 78 and it's verse 79. And because of the tender mercy of our God, from which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. To guide our feet in the way of peace. I want you to notice that phrase, tender mercy, because that phrase, that one state or two words, tender mercy, characterizes God's entire plan. It's not just a harsh kind of mercy that an angry God sort of said, oh, well, I'll be merciful. But it actually means to be moved with extraordinary compassion so as to extend mercy. That's at the very heart of Christ's coming to be birthed on the planet and then to die for us. And he's referred to as the sunrise on high because there were those who were sitting in darkness. And it's a phrase that comes up also in the prophet Isaiah. But the word sit there is not to sit in a relaxed way. It means to be literally immobilized. There are people sitting in darkness and because of the fear, the anxiety, the stress, the issues of life, they feel immobilized in life, in distress, in fear, gripping them and under the shadow of death and under Roman occupation, if you weren't a Roman citizen, death and other things, you didn't have many rights at all, none at all. And so you have these people and it says, God's sunrise in the coming of Jesus is about to break out on you. The sunrise from heaven, Jesus appeared. And I want us to pick up a reading from Luke 2, chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. And I love the way Luke connects it to historical figures. It's not once upon a time in a land far, far away. He actually mentions historical figures who can be identified and have been established. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. How amazed must the angels have been when they saw the Creator born as a creature, when the eternal Word became a speechless baby? And Luke then introduces us to some of the first recipients of God's message of peace, namely the shepherds. And Luke's account is powerful and it's poetic, and we're going to read it. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. 
And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is an extraordinary thing. These angels appearing and announcing the birth of Christ to shepherds. Because shepherds were very poor and they were outcasts. They were considered dishonest. And there's a lot of writing by the rabbis of the time who viewed them not only as dishonest and thieves, petty criminals, but also unclean because of the work they did and unable to enter the temple. And yet they are probably looking after sheep to be sacrificed in the temple. And Max Licardo says this, the announcement went first to the shepherds. They didn't ask God if they were sure that he knew what he was doing. The angels went to the shepherds, men who didn't know enough to tell God that Messiah's aunt found sleeping in a manger and inferring they should be in a palace somewhere. And so the outcasts are the first ones to receive good news. And this is a theme for Luke and a theme for the coming of Christ. It's to the marginalized, to those who don't think they've got it all together. The Messiah comes and brings salvation and healing and wholeness and peace. Somebody said this was entirely theologically appropriate. All the poor, insignificant, forgotten people of the world can gather around the manger and dare to believe that the babe who lies there really belongs to them. But Zechariah said he's going to guide our feet in the paths of peace. The angel said to the shepherds, it will be peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so I want to talk about some aspects of peace. Firstly, we all need peace in our circumstances. And right now, without a shadow of doubt, there's some people here who your circumstances are terrible or a part of your life is in a total state of evil and there's not a lot of peace there. And we acknowledge that life can be very unfair at times. In all circumstances, in all our struggles, Jesus continues to show up. And sometimes we don't recognize him. We don't realize that he's actually there. And this is a moment to, as it were, take a breath and say in the turmoil, in the pain, in the distress, in the fear that grips my heart, where there's a lack of peace, Jesus, I welcome you as the Prince of Peace. You see, this is a peace that defies your circumstances. It's not dependent on what goes on in your circumstances. This is something that comes to your heart, your mind, your spirit. A peace that heals, a peace that guards your heart, protecting your heart and mind from anxiety. Paul, while in prison, awaiting execution, And the book of Philippians says this, and I just want you to think of that, awaiting execution, writes these words, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, in that situation, under pressure, Paul says there's a way to find peace regardless of how chaotic, threatening, fearful your circumstances are. And that's by simply coming to God and honestly speaking your heart, your fears, your anxieties, making your requests. And he says, when you do that, the peace of God. And I want you to notice, it's not your peace, it's his peace that comes to you. It's the peace of God. It's not that that I've now meditated and calmed myself enough and it's now my hold on to peace. And there's nothing wrong with sitting quietly and 
Biblical meditation is important. We're not talking about an Eastern style of meditation, but biblical meditation is important. Meditate on the character, the word, the promises of God. But it's in that that you invite God's peace to begin to fill your heart. And I'd encourage you, if your circumstances are chaotic and there's a lack of peace, why don't you, as we head into the holiday period, Maybe get up earlier one morning. I know it's summer, sun is rising early and it still feels like winter. You may need to dress like an Eskimo or uh, you know, rug up dramatically. But sit somewhere where you can see the sunrise and let the sun of righteousness, sunrise, break into your life so he can guide your feet in the way of peace. And as those rays just warm your body and you reflect on Jesus, invite the peace of God, the Prince of Peace, to come into your circumstance. You see, in the chaos, Jesus is there to calm the storm and to guide your feet into the way of peace. Because peace isn't found in the absence of problems. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus. I want to say that again. Peace isn't found in the absence of problems. True peace is found in the presence of Jesus. There's also the issue of peace in the storms. And this is just an extension of general circumstances where maybe right now you're midst, in the midst of a trial. You're midst in crashing waves and threatening things just all about you. And when Jesus turns up in the middle of a Roman occupation after Israel has experienced centuries of suffering and there are people who are literally wondering and maybe like you, where's God in this? Where's God in my circumstance? But Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace and he shows up in the storms of life that threaten our peace. And obviously I'm going to read one of the gospel accounts, Luke's in fact, of when Jesus sent the disciples to the other side and an enormous storm broke out and they were threatened. Even though they were experienced fishermen, they felt threatened by what was going on around them in the storm that hit their lives. So Luke 8 verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes God's gone to sleep in your life? Don't look at me like that. You've thought it sometimes. Where's God? He fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. And the disciples went and woke him. Master, master, we're going to drown. One of the other gospel writers said, they said to him, don't you care that we're perishing? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. And he said, where is your faith? Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. I've learned to pray something over the years and it's based out of a verse in the book of Jude where it says that Michael the archangel didn't even dare to bring a railing accusation against the devil when he contended for the body of Moses but said the Lord rebuke you. And sometimes when I feel like I've been swept up in a storm, I pray, Lord, into this circumstance, would you come and would you rebuke the storm in this situation? Would you deal with it? The Lord rebuke you. I'm not doing it in my authority. I'm not trying to claim something. I'm just saying, God, I need you to step into this and rebuke what's going on and deal with it and give me peace and wisdom to walk in the path of peace, as Zechariah said. But he asked this question, where is your faith? And for some of us, we might feel that's intimidating. We might feel like it's a rebuke, but I actually don't think it is. I think it's an encouragement to get our eyes off the waves, off the storm, off the wind, off the chaos and back onto him. He's saying to him, don't put your faith in the boat, even though you experience fishermen, the majority of them. Don't put your faith in your skill and ability, even though God will use that in your circumstance. He says, you need to put your faith in me if you want peace 
in the storm. You need to put your trust in me. And that's easy to say, but again, I would encourage that thing of just quietening yourself, finding somewhere where you can sit and just welcome the presence of Jesus, whether it's by reading a passage of Scripture, whether it's by listening to some music or a combination of it and saying, I need the Prince of Peace to step into this circumstance and bring peace to my heart and my anxious mind. Because the third thing I want to bring to your attention, that peace is a circumstance. It's not a circumstance, sorry. It's a person. Peace is a person. Peace is found in Jesus. In Ephesians 2 and verse 14, it says, He Himself is our peace. And I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure I'm speaking for others. Sometimes in the pursuit of peace in a circumstance, you're trying to find this emotion, this thing, or to stop what you sense to be chaos. But you don't find peace in that. You find peace in the person of Jesus. For He Himself is our peace. And when we welcome Him, we are welcome Him as Lord, as Saviour, as Redeemer, as Deliverer, but as the Prince of Peace into our circumstance. And Isaiah gave Him that total long before He came. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon His shoulders, and He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the... Prince of Peace, for He Himself is our peace. And the Hebrew word for peace is so rich, it's much more than just the absence of conflict or turmoil. The word is shalom, and it brings a sense of tranquility, wholeness, completion, blessing in it. And so He Himself is our peace, and He will guide us in the way of peace. Most of us would be familiar with Matthew 11, 28, 29, and you may, you may not know the reference, but you'll know the words is more what I'm saying. Where Jesus says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest or peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. But listen to the emphasis. Come to me. Come to me. For he himself is our peace. And He is the one that guides us in the path of peace. And so we talk about peace in our general circumstances and in our mind. Peace in the midst of a trial, a storm that has hit our lives. Discovering that peace is a person. We find our peace in the person of Jesus Christ. But there's another aspect to peace that I want to conclude with. And that's having peace with God. Peace with God. St. Augustine said this, You have made us for yourselves, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. Let me repeat that. Wonderful quote from St. Augustine. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. And so the question I want to ask you, whether here in the auditorium, in our online campus, have you found peace with God? Not just peace in your circumstance, that's important, peace in the trial, but have you found peace with God? Are you at peace with God? Are you in a right relationship with God? Because the Bible teaches that when we live our lives independent of Him, we actually are fighting against God. We were created by Him and for Him and for His purposes. And He wants us to be in that relationship. That at the very heart of Christmas. A child is born so that as a son, He could be given on Calvary. We could die on that cross for us. 
See, peace with God is about this dealing with our conflict, our disobedience, our walking away from God. And that's why I love that quote by St. Augustine when he says, you've made us for yourselves and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. And this peace is something that's freely given to us when we put our faith, our trust in the Prince of Peace who paid the price to wash away our sins and to pour out God's mercy and grace and forgiveness and cleansing and restoration to us. Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. You see, we don't have peace with God by trying to be good, trying to be better, trying to stop doing things that we know are sinful. That will flow from our relationship with God. But you don't find peace with God by religious works, by human effort. You are made right, we are made right in God's sight by putting our trust in all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has done. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. 